Hello everyone, Professor Dustin here, and in this video I'm going to talk about the conditions for a force to be conservative. So you're probably already aware uh, what it means for a force to be conservative. Usually what we say is that the force is path independent. That path independence means that no matter what path you take to get from the initial state of your system to the final state of your system, the work done by that force is not going to depend on the path taken. Recall that the work done by a force is the integral of the dot product of the force dotted with the displacement uh, infinitesimal. And so when you go from an R1 to an R2, the first point to the last point, the uh, path independence of this work means that if I took this path versus this path versus this path, they would all be equal to each other. So the work done on each path would be exactly the same. Our intuitive understanding about this comes from the force of gravity, which of course is a conservative force and is path independent. The, the easiest, easiest way to see this way, is perhaps with the simple experiment where like you pick up a ball and you bring the ball to the top of the table and then you push the ball off and see how the ball falls under the influence of gravity. So how did you get the ball up to the top of the table? Well, you could have picked it up, moved it over here, carried it over there, and eventually brought it back to the top of the table. Or you could have done something more direct, which is take the ball and put it directly on top of the table. Nothing about the process you took to bring the ball to its location at the top of the table changes anything about the amount of energy it lost when it fell off the table. So you must have done the same amount of work to take the ball from here on this path to there as you did to take the ball from this path to there. This is different than forces that, for instance, depend on the path. The best example there is the force of friction. So to, so to think about that, let's say we have a block of mass M. We want to take it from point A, which is going to start here, to point B over here. If there is friction between the box and the ground, let's say, and we go from here to here, we're going to do a certain amount of work on the box to get it to do that uh, because of the force of friction. But if we take the box in this longer path before we bring it to point B, we're obviously going to be doing more work on the box to push it against friction because friction is acting along the entire path with the same amount if, if we're talking about kinetic friction. So the work done along path one is going to be less than the work done along path two. And I should be a little careful to say that I'm talking about the work due to friction here. There could be other forces going on in this problem, like how much I'm pushing, um, which will change the kinetic energy. But when I make this kind of statement, I'm talking about how much force, how much work the force of friction is doing. So from one perspective, this path independence is important because it allows us to make the following statement about um, the work done, which is that the work is the negative change in the potential energy. So we can only make that statement for conservative works because we don't want to have to declare what this path is when we write delta u. Delta u only knows about the beginning and the end of the path. It doesn't know anything about how the path is actually transversed. So we can only write statements like this for conservative works, we, conservative forces. We can always write stuff like that. We can always calculate the work due to some force along some path. We can only do this for conservative forces. But of course, we want to do this as much as possible. We want to use delta u's as much as possible. So it is very beneficial for us to know when a force is path independent. Of course, if you're going to actually check that a force is path independent, it kind of feels like you would have to check every single path in the universe, right? You have a starting point and an ending point, and you'd have to like do an integral over every single path to make sure that the thing is actually path independent. Obviously, that's not a reasonable thing to ask us to do for a given force. So what I'm going to talk about is how we can actually determine a force is path independent by using some mathematical conditions on the force itself. So we first want to make sure that we understand a little bit more about what this uh, integral is. So this integral is along a particular line. So this is along a path. And that makes this integral a line integral. So we've probably done line integrals in calculus before, but just to be clear, we don't, we're not going to have to use any technicalities of line integrals, but we just have to keep track to make sure that we're actually taking an integral along a line. This is not like integrating just along the x-axis or along the y-axis. There's a requirement, a relationship between the x and y-axis, which is being used here when we pick a particular line. That's obviously a complexity, which we're trying to get rid of because we want to make sure that the dependence on the path goes away. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make turn this line integral into what's called a closed loop integral by writing that. So that basically means that wherever I start, the point that I start at is also the point that I end at. So I'm still having to declare a path, whatever path it is. Here's several examples of paths that start and end in the same location. But I am now only talking about paths that start and end in the same place. So they're closed loop integrals. And I'm going to consider every single one of them. So I'm going to write over all possible loops under that integral. And I'm going to make the key statement, which is that the closed loop integral for all loops for any loop is going to be equal to zero. So this is like I do the integral around any loop I pick. doesn't matter which loop I pick. I will always get zero. If that is true, then it turns out that the force is conserved. What's even better is that there's a reverse statement which is that not only if you go from one direction that the, the left-hand side is true, then the right-hand side is true. If the right-hand side is true, then the left-hand side is also true. So this is a very powerful theorem in uh, theoretical mechanics and um, mathematics, which is that the conservative force is given by the fact that the uh, loop integral is zero for any loop that you pick. So this is the thing which I really want to prove in this video. And it turns out what's really nice about this proof is it doesn't require a lot of complex mathematics. It really just requires some logical thinking about what it implies for all loops, the integral of all loops, to be zero. So that's why I want to make this video. Is this is kind of a unique approach to a proof in physics, which is that it is basically entirely based on the logic around something which is zero for all loops, the integral of something which is zero for all loops. It has deep implications, and you can use those implications to find out logical things about it like that implies the force is conservative and path independent. So let's get going. What we're going to do is we're going to break the proof into two steps. We're going to do one in one direction, meaning we're going to assume this is true and then prove that if that's true, then this is true. And then we're going to go backwards. We're going to say if we have a conservative force, which is path independent, we're going to go backwards and prove that this must be true about this force. Okay, so let's do the forwards direction first. So the first thing I'm going to do is pick an origin, which is going to be my starting point, and then pick a loop. This loop is going to start at the origin and is going to go back to the origin because I want to start with the condition I have on the left-hand side, which is I am taking an integral over some uh, loop. How I drew this particular loop doesn't matter because the statement of the theorem is for all loops, and this is a loop which I picked without any conditions on it, so that doesn't particularly matter. Now I'm going to pick a point on this loop, another point, Take that point P. And then I'm going to draw another path from the origin to P. Now that we see we actually have two paths, the first path I'm going to label gamma, and the second path, which is now O to P, but now following the new path that I made from O to P, I'm going to call that gamma prime. But since the integral of this force for all loops is going to be zero, it means that both of those paths will have the closed integral loop of zero. So the loop integral over uh, path gamma is going to be zero because it is a loop and it is true for all loops and the closed loop integral around gamma prime is going to be zero as well. But if that's true, then it means that the path integral between the line integral between O and P along this blue line can't depend on how I pick that path because I picked that path completely generically. I didn't say I had to stay inside this path, I didn't say I had to go outside, I didn't say I had to make the shortest possible path, it was completely generic. So that means that the integral between O and P is path independent. In fact, since I picked not only the white path and the red path generically, I also picked the point P on the white path generically, I made all those decisions generically without conditions on them, so that means that this thing is path independent for us all possible paths between O and an arbitrary point P. Since I made all de those decisions in a generic fashion, it means that as long as the loop integral is zero for all loops, any path that I pick is path independent for any path that I pick, and that's the condition of being a conservative force. So I didn't use any sort of technical aspects of integrals or any sort of technical aspects of forces or conservative forces or anything else just saying that because this is such a restrictive condition, 
it means, therefore, that the force is conservative if it satisfies this restrictive condition. Okay, so that was going from the left-hand side to the right-hand side. Let's clear the blackboard and do from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. So I want to go the other direction just to remind you that means if uh, the force is path independent, meaning the work is path independent, then the closed integral um, of the force overall paths is going to be zero. That's what I want to prove. So first, first thing I'm going to do is pick another path, again completely arbitrary, call it gamma, and I'm going to calculate the force along this closed, the, the uh, the work along this closed path, gamma, and I'm going to do this by proof by contradiction. So I'm first going to say, what if actually this is a number which is not equal to zero? And then I'm going to see the consequences of this and find out that the consequences cannot be true and therefore the assumption cannot be true. So now I'm going to pick another path. This path is going to be gamma prime. And notice that no matter how I pick this path, I'm going to get the same answer as I did originally because my assumption is that the, um, the force integral, the loop integral is path independent. So whatever I write here, I'm gonna get the exact same answer, C, for the integral. Well, what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm actually gonna pick gamma prime to be very special. I'm gonna pick gamma prime to be two times gamma. So what that means is that I start at the beginning point and I go around the loop gamma twice. That is just what that two times gamma means. Okay, well that had better be true then that I get the loop integral around gamma prime, which is of course the same as twice around gamma, had better be the exact same answer that I got for the first one, C, again, not equal to zero. That's again, based on the assumption of path independence. I changed the path, I should not get a different answer. But of course, there's a problem here with the way that integrals work. The closed integral around the path to gamma is going to be exactly the same as the closed integral of each gamma done individually. First the first one, and then the second one. But of course we know what the answers to each of those individual integrals should be because we started with that. We started with, let's say, that the integral around the closed path is going to be equal to some non-zero value c. So that means that I can write here this should be c plus c is equal to 2 times c. But here's our fundamental contradiction. I, in for one argument, I, I assumed this. From that followed that if I went around the path twice, I should get c again. But here from this other argument, if I follow the, around the path twice, I should get 2c. So what that implies is that c has to be equal to 2c, and that's a fundamental contradiction. That cannot ever be true. Unless, of course, c is equal to zero, and of course that cancels out our assumption up here. So this is proof by contradiction. This cannot be true. Instead, it must be that for any path, the loop integral had better be zero, because if it's not, you run into this fundamental contradiction. And since I didn't make any assumptions about how I picked this path, this has to be true for any path. There's not a single path out in the universe for any force where uh, if you happen to pick it, this, this would fall apart. No, it has to be true for any path because I picked this absolutely generically. I made no decisions uh, or preconceptions about how I picked it. It's a total generic path. Okay, so I have shown this uh, big fancy and interesting theorem which is that if the closed loop integral around all paths of a force is zero, that means the force is conservative and vice versa. If the force is conservative, it means any uh, integral around the all the paths is actually zero. So that's a nice condition, but of course, like still checking all of the paths sounds like a problem, right? So although we've proven that there is this nice relationship between this guy and what we want, f is conservative, we really haven't shown how to figure out all paths actually have this property that the integral around the closed loop is going to be zero. So the trick we're going to use here real quickly is called Stokes' theorem. So Stokes' theorem essentially allows you to convert integrals around closed paths into area integrals of the area enclosed by the path. 
Now, Stokes Theorem is very generic. It allows you to convert any kind of boundary integral into an interior integral, but in our context, we want to have a one-dimensional path being converted to a surface integral, and that means the following. So for any function, a vector function dotted with the displacement vector and integrated over the path, notice this is the exact condition we want. I'm just using an arbitrary vector instead of this uh, force vector here. And this is for a particular path, so for any path that's here, it happens that this is equal to the area integral over the surface S of the curl of the original vector V. Now to get this right, you have to dot it with a uh, normal vector, which is normal to the surface. And then you have to put the uh, uh, infinitesimal area element on there to get it right. So proving Stokes' theorem, which is, this is a specialization of Stokes' theorem to two dimensions, proving this is a whole other video, so I'm not going to go into that. So we can just take this theorem as a fact for us. But Stokes' theorem says we can convert these line integrals around closed paths into surface integrals across the area of the entire thing. Well, what if we do that to our um, example here? So instead of doing all paths, I'm just going to pick an arbitrary path gamma and start by writing this thing in the arbitrary path. That's that, where I have just replaced... Um, this arbitrary vector V with our force vector F. And then I'm just going to rewrite the right-hand side of Stokes' theorem, except with the F in here instead of, um, instead of the V, which looks like that. That's just copying down the V to the F. So this appears to not have helped us all that much because we still have this some path which we have to specify, some surface we have to specify, an area element. So that seems not all that helpful until we remember that the theorem we're trying to use, this thing is actually zero. So this thing is going to be zero for the theorem we want. And if we look inside here and decide what things in here have to be zero, the area element can't be zero, this normal vector can't be zero, S can't be zero if it's not a trivially, infinitesimally small, some kind of surface area. So it just means that the curl of the force has to be equal to zero. And that is a really nice condition to have because we know how to take cross products of the gradient like that. We know how to take curls. We can just plug in whatever force we want. We can take this particular differential product of it. We know how to take cross products. If it's equal to zero, then we have a conservative force. So finally, we get away from this very um, abstract concept of conservative forces and path independence being related to this closed path integral for all paths, which we somehow can't calculate. But we get to this really nice formula, which is that as long as we have given a random force, as long as the curl of that force is zero, then the first force is conservative. And in fact, it works the other direction as well. If we start with a conservative force, we know that this is true, and therefore we know that this is true. So this completes the loop of how we really should understand the theoretical criteria for conservative forces. It's right here. The curl of the force has to be zero. Okay, great. So I hope this video was interesting um, and helpful. The idea is that we want to understand the conservative force is not in this sort of abstract all sort of paths language but in the sense of what conditions must we have on the forces in order for them to be path um, independent and actually conservative and therefore we can write it's relative to some delta u which is the condition we really want to use in theoretical physics now this exact argument there's lots of different ways of making it how uh, this one came about i actually don't know i found it in some old notes of mine so if anybody knows the source of this original kind of argumentation about the various paths. I'd love to hear it, um, but I actually don't know what the origin of it is. It was just buried in some notes I had from a previous class. Okay, great. That's it. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you guys around.